What's up, Grace Nation? Hi, church fam. We miss you guys. We're praying for you every single day. The staff, um, if you guys have any prayer requests, comment, send them on in. We are thinking of you. You are not alone in this, and we're excited to be here. Yes, and uh, you can see a shot of my <laughs> one of my little girls. Yes, Shay. But yeah, we're stoked to be here with you. Um, obviously, we wish that we could all be gathered in one place. Um, but, uh, and nothing's going to keep us down. So we're, we're so thankful for technology that we can still share a live word to you and, uh, and minister to you and pray for you. And yeah, we'll have a good time. Okay. So, uh, if you need to get up out of your seat, if you need to stretch a little bit, uh, you know, shake out some, uh, some tight muscles from sitting, laying in bed in your PJs. <laughs> Maybe you spilled some milk during Pastor Tom's message, but uh, don't get too comfortable there. We're, once this whole thing's over, we're still going to come gather here. But That's right. We want you back here on Sunday. We definitely miss the fellowship and seeing all your smiling faces. Anyways, thanks, babe. Love you. All right. So I do have a word for you, and uh, uh, my mic's on. Everything's good, right? We're good? Okay, cool. Um, so the, the title of my message today... Uh, as I was thinking about today and, uh, you know, we had planned on going into uh, a new series leading up to Easter, which would be on John chapter 17. So what we're going to do is we're going to do that. But before we go to John chapter 17, which is a prayer of Jesus right before he goes uh, to the cross and suffers and goes through his passion for us, he has this prayer to God that's recorded for us. It's a beautiful prayer that really shows us uh, purpose and uh, intent and kind of identity for us, the church, the body of Christ, and talks about unity. It talks about love and so forth. So we're going to uh, go through that over the next couple weeks, and I'm really pumped about that, especially today. Today's message is something that really touches my heart, um, just because we'll, we'll we'll get into that. But before we go to John chapter 17, first turn to Matthew chapter 26. And if you have your Bible with you, awesome. If you don't, the the slides or the um, scripture should come up on the screen there at home for you so you can read along. Give me a second as I turn. It sure is quiet in this Presbyterian church. Ha, 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 ha. Anyways, okay. Matthew chapter 26, verse 6. It says, now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But I had a nickel every time I've heard someone say that. I'd have like 10 cents. But anyways, why, Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Verse 14. Then one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Jumping to verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Turn to whoever you're with at home and say, not as I will, but as you will. Thank you. I have a couple of people. That's awesome. What's going on? Gotcha. Oh, they're, they're being interactive with me. Wonderful. Thank you. Anyway, not as I will, 
but as you will. As I was meditating on these scriptures here, I couldn't help but notice, as Pastor Tom brought out in his message, the transition from a time of feeding the multitudes to a time of trouble, a trial, a storm. That if you see here, you have a a, a contrast of two moments in Jesus' life. You've got the highest of highs followed by the lowest of lows. You've got Jesus who is in the midst of being honored and being praised and being accepted As Mary brings the expensive uh, alabaster flask of very expensive perfume, pours it on his head. I mean, for me, that might be a little uncomfortable, but, but pours it on his head. And now Jesus is dripping with this ointment. If you can imagine with me the fragrance of that room, the entire room where everybody was sitting was beautiful. It was smelling so nice. There was this aroma. It's this picture of a, of a wonderful, good environment, right? An environment that is pleasurable. And then the very next moment, Matthew says, then one of the 12, one of those that was closest to Jesus, one of the ones that had been with him through the ups and downs of ministry, one of the ones he trusted, in fact, trusted so much, he was in charge of the finances of Jesus's ministry. This was someone that followed him, slept with him, walked with him, ate with him, someone he shared his heart with, the the inner workings of his heart, the secrets, and this one would betray him and reject him. It's a picture of a moment you're riding high where people are loving you, they're shouting your praises, they're saying how awesome you are, and in the very next moment, the person that you trusted blindsides you and rejects you. It's this this moment of riding high followed by this moment of riding low. And I ask myself, Jesus, how in the world? Because this isn't the only time this happened. Welcome to life. Welcome to earth. You're going to go through ups and downs. And my question is, Jesus, how is it that you maintain confidence? How is it that you maintain security and assurance throughout the ups and downs? And I realize I've discovered it in the garden as Jesus is praying. He says to God, as he's under pressure and as he's in this the most Uh, pressure he's ever experienced where he's now dripping drops of blood as he's praying. He says, not, but not what I will, but what you will. Jesus was not as concerned about the praise and acceptance of people as much as he was concerned about doing the will of God. Jesus was less concerned about rejection and not being accepted and the lows of life as concerned as doing the will of God. I'm not saying the highs weren't great and I'm not saying the lows didn't hurt. What I'm saying is Jesus was able to continue walking with confidence and purpose because he kept his eyes on the will of God. He was not living for the praise of man so he would not be defeated by the rejection of man. Jesus was living living in relationship with God, saying, not what I want, but what you want. And I'm telling you, I don't care what comes your way in life, coronavirus or rejection or financial problems, financial pressure, whatever it is, you can remain confident because no matter what comes your way, there is a will of God in that moment. I am not caring so much about the financial difficulties I'm facing. My mind is on God. What is your will? I'm going to do that. So let's fast forward. Let's jump to John chapter 17, verse 3. I mean, we're going to read verse 1. John 17, verse 1 to 5, and then we're going to look at verse 3. John 17, 1 through 5. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, now this is his prayer. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this, this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now notice that real quick. How did Jesus glorify God? By fulfilling his purpose. 
And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, what I love about this verse is how amazing it is in Jesus describing to us and giving us an explanation of what eternal life is. If you ask anybody, Christians included, the majority of people, what is eternal life? They will say, it means living forever. And that is not eternal life. That is everlasting life. Eternal life does not refer or imply the duration of life. Eternal life refers to the quality of life. It is the quality of the life of God in the believer. It is not referring to an endless life. It is referring to Jesus's own life. It is referring to the very life force of God, the quality of life. And this is what Jesus says it is. This is life. Not that you've got a mansion and five boats and three cars and tons of money in the bank and a healthy body and everybody loves you. That's not life. That's not abundant life. Abundant life is knowing God. I'm going to let that sink in for just a second there. Because if that, if abundant life, if this life that, that Jesus came to give us is knowing God, knowing him, no one can take that from me. Whatever comes my way, whatever I am facing in life, it doesn't change from my purpose or the abundant life of knowing God in the midst of it. See, if I'm experiencing nothing but good, a nice environment where it smells nice because the perfume's been poured over me, guess what? I'm still purposed to know God because if I don't know God in that environment, I'm still not gonna experience life. But even when it's a bad time and I'm rejected and not accepted and I'm facing difficulty, guess what? I can still know God and have abundant life in that. Knowing God. This word knowing isn't just knowing about God. I I need you to understand that this word knowing is is the Greek word genosko that implies relationship. It is experiential knowledge. It is not knowing information about somebody. It is not just knowing things about God, but it is about knowing him relationally. Let me explain a little deeper here. Uh, I myself use the term all the time, and, and you hear it all the time, especially today, where it's all about relationship, not religion. You know? and, and, and that is absolutely true. But I don't think we realize that religion a lot of times can be easier than relationship. I don't know about you, but if you're married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Angela and I now have been married for almost 10 years in January, and I am just now figuring out who I married. You know, Tim Keller, who, who's in New York, he wrote a book, and he was talking about that it usually takes married couples seven years to discover that they didn't marry who they thought they married. Let me explain. This is why. Because we as humans aren't really good at relationships. God actually has to teach us how to be in a relationship with somebody, because this is what we do in relationships, is especially in marriage, is we like to project onto the other person who we want them to be. So we don't actually let them self-define. We, in the name of love, manipulate and cause them and try to control them to be what we want them to be to supply my needs. That, my friends, is self, selfishness that does not come from God. And so what happens is during these years, and I eventually let learn in relationship. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. But I can say that our marriage is better today than it ever has been. It, marriage does not get worse. It gets better. But, and, and that brings up another point. It doesn't matter how long you've been married. You can be married 100 years, 10 years. 20 years, however long you've been married tells me nothing about the level of relationship in your marriage. See, you may have been married a long time, but you can't stand each other. And it's the same thing with salvation. You might say you're a Christian, that you got saved 20 years ago, but that actually tells me nothing about how your relationship with God is doing. Because what happens is relationship evolves and grows as I do this very difficult thing. 
especially guys for me, this part is the most challenging part of my life. And that is this, listening. I have to stop what I'm doing and I have to listen to my wife tell me about her crazy, gnarly dreams. I have to stop and listen to about what so-and-so said or what she likes or what she doesn't like. And it doesn't end there. After I listen to what she likes, I have to compute it in my brain. And then it doesn't even end there. Relationship means instead of me projecting onto her who she is, I'm going to let her self-define and tell me who she is, which involves listening and then comprehending and then watch this, doing. Oh, imagine you listen, you comprehend, and now you know what she likes, and yet you don't do it. You will not ever, with that method, grow in relationship. And see, we do this a lot with God, don't we? We project onto God what we think he should be. We, we project onto him through whatever means, subconscious manipulation or try to control him and say, God, this is who I, I need you to be. This is who I want you to be. So instead of letting God self-define who he is, we try to project onto him who we want him to be. So this makes sense of, of course we would have a Bible. Of course we would have this because God is not just some cosmic force. God is not the universe. As so many, you know, the universe is going to answer your prayer. No, 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 no. The, God is a person. He is a person with, with likes. He, God is a person with dislikes. God, God is a person with preferences. And, and so, of course, we have a Bible that this is God saying, hey, guys, this is who I am. These are the things I like. These are the things I dislike. And I am inviting you into relationship with me where, guess what? You get to listen to me, comprehend and understand me, and then do it. See, it's no longer me projecting onto God. Like, imagine Jesus in the garden no, God, I don't want to go this way. All things are possible with you. So let's go ahead and take a different cup here. Let's go a different way because I don't want to do this. That's not relationship. Relationship, there, or rather this, there is no relationship without sacrifice. This is my main point of today. Relationship requires sacrifice. When I got married, I said yes to one woman and I sacrificed the other six billion women on the earth. When I said yes to Mary Angela, I said yes to her, and I said no to myself. I no longer live for Josh's pleasures, desires, and needs. I live for Angela's pleasures, desires, and needs. But what would, you're like, man, that totally stinks. Like, I don't want that, but just wait till we get going. So when I sacrifice what I want by doing what she wants. Listen, I don't like chocolate chip cookies. I don't really care for ice cream. I don't really care for tons of donuts and stuff. She loves that stuff. I, it, 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 sorry. Okay, you know, she likes that stuff. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to sacrifice what I want for what she wants. I don't like holding hands. I, I, I'm not a big fan of hugs. Like hugs are great, cool, but I don't need them to survive. Uh, cuddling, that's not my forte. Like I like distance in bed. Like give me that six foot rule all the time, please. But she likes that. So when I go to bed though, am I gonna enforce my rules? If I do, I shouldn't have never got married. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls that are wanting to get married, please realize that the moment you get married, you die to yourself. I'm no longer living by what I want now. I'm living for her. I want to please her. I want to bless her. Relationship requires sacrifice. And so I need you to understand that in this relationship with God, God has given you complete and total free will and liberty giving you the opportunity, the privilege to respond to his grace, to respond to his love by sacrificing your own will at the altar and take on his will. 
His will are his desires, his thoughts, and what he's doing. And the first way we do this is by our service to him with our hands. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. I've got 12 minutes left, so I'm going to go really fast. I'm not going to turn my Bible. I'm going to read it. But 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Look at this. It says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. To be a holy priesthood. Listen, you at home in your PJs, eating and making a mess or whatever you're doing. You are a priest. You are a priest to offer spiritual, there's that word we don't really like, sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, God, you know, that's cool. Like, I'm totally wanting this relationship with you, but I really think some of the things you're asking and wanting are not cool. Like, I'm going to go about my own way and do things my way, and I'll take Jesus for salvation or AKA my ticket to heaven. That's not relationship. See, that's where religion is actually easier than relationship because religion, I can just go through the motions. I can go to church on Sunday. I can pray a prayer that I'm reading or something and my heart never be in it. But I'm jumping ahead of myself real quick. But notice you are a priest. See, that was the thing with the Reformation when Martin Luther and his 95 problems against the Catholic Church, one of the problems was he was reading this thing and he's like, wait a minute, why am I going to a priest between me and God? I am that priest. Like, I'm a priest and what do priests do? Priests, the job description of a priest. And notice, I don't care if you lost your job, you got laid off, you, you, the coronavirus is hurting, whatever, you never lose this job. You are fully employed 24-7 as a priest. That's your number one occupation. You are a priest forever. You are a priest, and a priest does two things. Number one, a priest ministers to God. So I, you got laid off, congratulations. You just got double time on your priestly duties. Like you get to go minister to God double time. Yeah, but you don't get paid for that. You get, what do you mean you don't get paid for that? You get eternal rewards, man. Okay, but your number one job is you get to minister to God. You get to bless him. The, the Hebrew word for praise, Judah, we know Judah, it's the Hebrew word yada. And yada, the, the root word of that word, yada, is the Hebrew word yod, which means hand. So sometimes you come to church and you wonder, why do, they, why do people lift their hands in worship? Because there's no such thing to a Hebrew or in tradition of praising God without raising your hands. Uh, the, 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 there, if you're praising God, you praise him with uplifted hands. That, that, that's what praise means. It's like, I'm praising you, you know, but, you know, sometimes we don't want to do that. So I'm praising you. No, 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 that's not, no, praise is lifting your, your yod. You're showing God. It's like a, a, sur a surrender. A, I am yours. I, your will. I worship you for you are good. Your mercy endures forever. I love you. I pray. And listen, we are praising him and worshiping him, not for who we are projecting him to be, but who he revealed himself to be. See, so when I open this book and I see who God is, now I praise who he actually is, who he says he is revealed in Jesus. So it's the yacht, it's the dealing with my priestly duty of spiritual sacrifices are lifting my hands, but also the implication is everything I do, do. Everything I do can be a spiritual sacrifice as unto the Lord. Hello, Ephesians, Colossians, Paul is writing to the church and he is saying, guys, everything you do, everything, going to Walmart to buy that toilet paper, everything you do, do as unto the Lord. Maybe you hate your job because you're doing it for your boss that you don't like, or you're doing it for that small paycheck that you also don't like. But if you did it as unto the Lord, it transforms your job from something dull and dead into something alive and sacrificial and worship to God. I'm telling you, everything we do can become a form of worship to him when we do it to him and unto him. Now that's fine. That's all fine and great. But you can also now become very religious because now you're just focused on, I'm going to do this, do that. And you're just checking off boxes. 
you're just, uh, you know, I, I went to church three times this month. Like I, I tithed, uh, you know, I gave, I, 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 whatever it might be you're doing. But, you know, one of the things that I believe, and this will offend a lot of people, that I believe God is like 60% woman. Because, because the thing is, that, that's not actually, th- please don't take that theologically or anything like that. Like, I'm just, because if you've ever been there, you're driving and your wife's sitting in the seat beside you and she's telling you some kind of story or some kind of thing that happened and you're just driving, right? You're like, hands at 10 and 2, keeping your eyes on the road, safety first, you know? You're like, yeah, uh-huh, yep, yeah, yeah. And then she's like, Oh my gosh, Josh, like, where are you right now? Uh, you're not even here. Like, you're here, but you're not here. You're, you're, you're hearing me, but you're not actually hearing me. Okay? And I know you know what I'm talking about. But see, I believe God's like that too. Like, God knows when you're actually there. Like, you're, 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 you're like, okay, I'm going to pray. And you're, you're listing off and saying all these prayers. But God's like, dude, you're... Like, I hear you, but you're not actually there right now. Like, you're, you're somewhere else. You're not into this. You're just giving me lip service. You know, God doesn't want you just to give him lip service. God doesn't want you just to give him your hands. What he wants is all of you. He wants your heart. Look at this really quickly in Psalm 57, 7, 8. It's a fascinating scripture. David is writing right after he ran from Saul into the cave of Abdullam, running for his life. And here he is in the cave of Abdullam, Abdullam and he writes this psalm. He says, my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Now watch this. Awake my glory. We're quite familiar with the glory of God. But I want you to catch this. This is David, if you can imagine, in a very rough spot in life. He's in a a tight spot too. Like he's running for his life and he's hiding in a cave. And it would be very easy in this moment. You know what it's like? I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like praising. And so you're like, okay, I'm just going to go do it anyways. I'm like, oh, Jesus, thank you for my life. Thanks for everything you're doing. You know, and, and, and you think just because that's what God wants. He just wants some lip service. He just wants some words. And, and see, that's why I'm all for you having those books that tell you what to pray and stuff. But the, the problem I do have with that is it can lead to you, your heart actually not being in it. Like you're just thinking that if I recite this, God will answer it. Like, that's not what this is about. Again, this is called relationship where I actually have to stop and listen to my wife and comprehend what she's saying, which means I'm using my brain to comprehend what she says. And sometimes it hurts. It's just because we have differences, you know? And then I get to do it. And and so God, David is saying, awake my glory. What is glory? The the Hebrew word is kabod, simply kabod. That's not very the right accent or anything, but it's kabod, which refers to weightiness. It's, it's the weightiness of God. It's the weightiness of you. It's your essence. It's what you're good at. It's what you carry. It's your gifts and the glory that God has bestowed upon you. What David is saying is awaken all that I am, my very heart and everything I am, so that I'm not just giving you hand service. I'm not just giving you my doing, but I'm giving you my heart in it. It is being dialed in. It is being connected with the heart of God. It is God. I'm not just in this as a religious experience. I'm not just going to come to church and sit and, oh my gosh, thank you for that message, you know, like consumer, but you come to worship and your heart is in it. You come to serve and be a part of what God is doing in the earth today. I'm telling you, it's relationship And, and relationships don't last long when the heart isn't in it. I'm telling you, that's what God wants is and, and but, but okay, and my final point because I got to skip. I got three minutes. Glory begets glory. Glory begets glory. David is saying, "Wake my glory," because I'm going to give it to God with the full confidence and understanding that glory begets glory. Watch this. When I actually do that relational thing with my wife, and I listen. 
and I comprehend, and I do, me giving her my glory and my heart, not just listening, okay, yeah, uh uh-huh, but actually being there, being there in the moment, listening, and, and having my heart in it with her. Guess what happens next? Glory begets glory. This marriage just took another level. You know what I'm saying? It, listen, there is nothing more difficult than marriage that I've experienced. There is nothing more also more rewarding than marriage. And if that is so rewarding, imagine what a sacrifice of my will and what I want, sacrificing that to give God my glory glory, to give God my heart. Imagine the reward of that, which is why I believe Jesus was so confident in the garden when he said, not my will, but your will be done, because he was laying himself as the sacrifice. He was going to put his life down because he had full confidence that God always responds with sacrifice or responds to sacrifice with fire. James chapter 4 verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. Remember hands, yod, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Now watch this. How do you draw near to an omnipresent God. If God is everywhere at once, how do you draw near to him? See, God is everywhere at once, but his glory is not everywhere at once. See, there's some people that you might know, they've got testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony of God doing things through them for their lives and other people's lives. And then there's other people that may have been saved a hundred years and they have no testimony. It's like, what's going on? Like, It's because some people decide, I don't want to sacrifice my life to gain his. See, they say the the relationship never evolved from step one, which was, God, what do you like? God, what are your preferences? How do you want me to go about my life? What do you want me to be doing? What are you thinking about this moment in the good? What are you thinking about this moment in the bad? The coronavirus, whatever might be, however, whatever it is and how big it is, God, what's your will in this? What do you want me to do? And I was just reading recently, uh, I have this manuscript of all, uh, uh, like a hundred or more uh, sermons that are unpublished by someone named John G. Lake, who was a minister in the early 1900s. And he was writing this story about this young man who had no drive or passion in life. And he, his parents were beginning to get worried about him because he didn't want to do anything, go anywhere. And if, you know, anyways. Um, and so what ended up happening though, is he ended up finding God or God, you know, find God found him in everything. He got saved, right? He found God. And, and then all of a sudden he began to give himself over to prayer and he couldn't stop praying. He was just praying and praying praying and praying and praying. And his dad was finally like, it's great that you got saved, but you need to get out here on the farm and start working, doing some work with me. And, but he couldn't leave this, this heart of prayer that he had. And so a a local in that local area, there was a woman who, who saw what God was doing on this young man's life and said, okay, you can come live with me. I have a room and, and I'll feed you so that you don't die. And you can stay here and continue on in prayer. Well, anyways, this was during the time of the Spanish flu that broke out. And the Spanish flu, which was much more intense and deadly than what we're even experiencing now. And I'm not downsizing the the deadliness of this and stuff. But what I'm saying is the Spanish flu was a terrible, terrible thing. And he had this spirit of prayer on him during this time. And God told him and led him to go out and start praying for these people that were afflicted with the Spanish flu. And people that he was praying for got healed and healed and healed and healed. So much, he was making such a, a, a ruckus about the healing power of God during this time that the government reached out to him, the medical community reached out to him. And this was right during uh, World War I where or this, there were all these soldiers and stuff that were coming back and fl- afflicted with this flu. And the government and the medical community started enlisting him to pray for the sick soldiers that were coming back. And John G. Lake said he had never seen a more powerful healing uh, wave through this man, other than, than through this man's life. And so what I'm saying is God wants to use you in this time. If you would stop and ask, not what I think about him and project on him, but God, what do you want me to do? 
What is on your heart? What is your will? I am surrendering, yielding my life to you. I don't want my will. I want your will. I am going to sacrifice myself. And as God's saying, he's promising you, you can have confidence in this, that as you draw near to him, he responds and draws near to you. When you lay your life on the altar and sacrifice your life, God always responds with fire. Finally, two minutes over, Romans chapter 11. Look at this. Because the glory that you have came from him to begin with. It says, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Listen, everything you have is from him. Everything good that is. Anything that we have that is glory and good, that we are laying at the altar, that we are sacrificing, again, we're, this is about relationship. This isn't about a religious thing of earning merit with God or trying to get God to accept us or get him pleased with us. No, no, no. This is relationship where I love you, God. I see how much you love me. I see what you laid on the altar for me, and I'm going to lay my own will down, and I want to say what your will be done. And because everything came from him to begin with. And then we know this verse very well. The very next verse in chapter 12, verse one, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which watch this is your spiritual worship. Look at this beautiful relationship God has invited us into. He is not looking for dead sacrifices. He doesn't want you dead. He doesn't want you sick and in pain, but he doesn't want your eyes on all of those things. He wants your eyes set on him and he wants you to live your life as a living sacrifice where it's not sacrificing it's sacrificing your own will and your own wants for his. And just like in the Old Testament, whenever the children of Israel offered a sacrifice and their heart was in it, the fire of God fell. In the Old Testament, the fire of God fell. It was the fire of judgment. But in the New Testament, look at in the upper room as the 120 were sacrificing their own lives as fishermen and their, their uh, occupations and everything. And they were focused on prayer and seeking God. And they were in that upper room. The fire of God fell once more. But this time it wasn't for judgment. This time it was to fill them with his very presence and power. And what I'm saying is we need Christians today that are more interested in being filled with God than anything else. I don't care. Listen, you can pursue money. You can pursue fame. You can pursue status. You can pursue all these things, but nothing will be compared to sacrificing all of that and saying, God, I want to be filled with you. I want to put my life on the altar and sacrifice my will for yours because I am confident and know that you will respond to this sacrifice with your fire. You will respond to this sacrifice with your glory, and I'm going to walk around this earth filled with God, seeing who I can bless and minister to. Amen.